Henrietta Lacks, Wikipedia Audio Henrietta Lacks was an African-American woman whose cancer cells are the source of the HeLa cell line, the first immortalized cell line and one of the most important cell lines in medical research. An immortalized cell line will reproduce indefinitely under specific conditions, and the HeLa cell line continues to be a source of invaluable medical data to the present day. Lax was the unwitting source of these cells from a tumor biopsied during treatment for cervical cancer at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, U.S., in 1951. These cells were then cultured by George Otto Gulley who created the cell line known as HeLa, which is still used for medical research. As was then the practice, no consent was obtained to culture her cells, nor were she or her family compensated for their extraction or use. Lax grew up in rural Virginia. After giving birth to two of their children, she married her cousin David Day Lax. In 1941 the young family moved to Turner Station in Baltimore County, Maryland so Day could work in Bethlehem Steel at Sparrows Point. After Lax had given birth to their fifth child, she was diagnosed with cancer. Tissue samples from her tumors were taken without consent during treatment and these samples were then subsequently cultured into the HeLa cell line. Personal Life even though some information about the origins of Hela's immortalized cell lines was known to researchers after 1970, the Lax family was not made aware of the line's existence until 1975. With knowledge of the cell line's genetic provenance becoming public, its use for medical research and for commercial purposes continues to raise concerns about privacy and patients' rights. Henrietta Lacks was born Loretta Pleasant on August 1, 1920, in Roanoke, Virginia, to Eliza and Johnny Pleasant. Her family is uncertain how her name changed from Loretta to Henrietta, but she was nicknamed Henny. When Lacks was four years old in 1924, her mother died giving birth to her tenth child. Unable to care for the children alone after his wife's death, Lack's father moved the family to Clover, Virginia, where the children were distributed among relatives. Lax ended up with her grandfather, Tommy Lax, in a two-story log cabin that was once the slave quarters on the plantation that had been owned by Henrietta's white great-grandfather and great-uncle. She shared a room with her nine-year-old cousin and future husband, David De Lax. Like most members of her family living in Clover, Lax worked as a tobacco farmer starting from an early age. In 1935, when Lax was 14 years old, she gave birth to a son, Lawrence Lax. In 1939, her daughter Elsie Lax was born. Both children were fathered by Day Lax. Elsie Lax had developmental disabilities and was described by the family as different or deaf and dumb. On April 10, 1941, Day and Henrietta Lax were married in Halifax County, Virginia. Later that year, their cousin, Fred Garrett, convinced the couple to leave the tobacco farm in Virginia and move to Maryland where Day Lax could work at Bethlehem Steel in Sparrows Point. Not long after they moved to Maryland, Garrett was called to fight in World War II. With the savings gifted to him by Garrett, Day Lax was able to purchase a house at 713 New Pittsburgh Avenue in Turner Station. Now part of Dundalk, Maryland, Turner Station was one of the oldest and largest African-American communities in Baltimore County at that time. Living in Maryland, Henrietta and Day Lax had three more children, David Sonny Lax, Jr., Deborah Lax Pullum, and Joseph Lax. 
Henrietta gave birth to her last child at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore in November 1950, four and a half months before she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Around the same time, Elsie Lax, was placed in the hospital for the Negro Insane, later renamed Crownsville Hospital Center, where Elsie died in 1955. On January 29, 1951, Lax went to Johns Hopkins, the only hospital in the area that treated black patients, because she felt a knot in her womb. She had previously told her cousins about the knot and they assumed correctly that she was pregnant. But after giving birth, Lax had a severe hemorrhage. Her primary care doctor tested her for syphilis, which came back negative, and referred her back to Johns Hopkins. There, her doctor, Howard W. Jones, took a biopsy of the mass on Lax's cervix for laboratory testing. Soon after, Lax was told that she had a malignant epidermoid carcinoma of the cervix. In 1970, physicians discovered that she had been misdiagnosed and actually had an adenocarcinoma. This was a common mistake at the time and the treatment would not have differed. Lax was treated with radium tube inserts as an inpatient and discharged a few days later with instructions to return for X-ray treatments as a follow-up. During her treatments, two samples were taken from Lax's cervix without her permission or knowledge, one sample was of healthy tissue and the other was cancerous. These samples were given to George Otto Gutty, a physician and cancer researcher at Johns Hopkins. The cells from the cancerous sample eventually became known as the HeLa Immortal Cell Line, a commonly used cell line in contemporary biomedical research. On August 8, 1951, Lax, who was 31 years old, went to Johns Hopkins for a routine treatment session and asked to be admitted due to continued severe abdominal pain. She received blood transfusions and remained at the hospital until her death on October 4, 1951. A partial autopsy showed that the cancer had metastasized throughout her entire body. Lax was buried in an unmarked grave in the family cemetery in a place called Lax Town in Halifax County, Virginia. Lax Town is the name that was given to the land in Clover. Virginia, that was originally owned by white, land and slave-owning members of the Lax family before the Civil War. Later generations gave the land to the many black members of the Lax family who were descendants of African slaves and their white owners. Illness Lax's exact burial location is unknown, but the family believes that it is within a few feet of her mother's grave site which for decades was the only one in the family to have been marked with a tombstone. In 2010, Roland Patillo, a faculty member of the Morehouse School of Medicine who had worked with George Gutty and knew the Lax family, donated a headstone for Lax. This prompted her family to raise money for a headstone for Elsie Lax as well, which was dedicated on the same day. The headstone of Henrietta Lacks is shaped like a book and contains an epitaph written by her grandchildren that reads. Henrietta Lacks, August 1, 1920 to October 4, 1951, in loving memory of a phenomenal woman, wife and mother who touched the lives of many, here lies Henrietta Lacks. Her immortal, cells will continue to help mankind forever eternal love and admiration, from your family. George Otto Gutty, the first researcher to study lax cancerous cells, observed that her cells were unique in that they reproduced at a very high rate and could be kept alive long enough to allow more in-depth examination. Until then, cells cultured for laboratory studies survived for only a few days at most 
which wasn't long enough to perform a variety of different tests on the same sample. Lax cells were the first to be observed that could be divided multiple times without dying, which is why they became known as immortal. After Lax's death, Gully had Mary Kubitschek, his lab assistant, took further HeLa samples while Henrietta's body was at Johns Hopkins autopsy facility. The roller tube technique was the method used to culture the cells obtained from the samples that Kubitschek collected. Gully was able to start a cell line from Lax's sample by isolating one specific cell and repeatedly dividing it, meaning that the same cell could then be used for conducting many experiments. They became known as HeLa cells, because Gully's standard method for labeling samples was to use the first two letters of the patient's first and last names. The ability to rapidly reproduce HeLa cells in a laboratory setting has led to many important breakthroughs in biomedical research. For example, by 1954, Jonas Salk was using HeLa cells in his research to develop the polio vaccine. To test his new vaccine, the cells were mass-produced in the first-ever cell production factory. Additionally, Chester M. Southam, a leading virologist, injected HeLa cells into cancer patients, prison inmates, and healthy individuals in order to observe whether cancer could be transmitted as well as to examine if one could become immune to cancer by developing an acquired immune response. HeLa cells were in high demand and put into mass production. They were mailed to scientists around the globe for research into cancer, AIDS, the effects of radiation and toxic substances, gene mapping, and countless other scientific pursuits. HeLa cells were the first human cells successfully cloned in 1955, and have since been used to test human sensitivity to tape glue, cosmetics, and many other products. Since the 1950s, scientists have grown 20 tons of her cells, and there are almost 11,000 patents involving HeLa cells. In the early 1970s, a large portion of HeLa cells became contaminated by other cell cultures. As a result, Members of Henrietta Lacks' family received solicitations for blood samples from researchers hoping to learn about the family's genetics in order to replace the contaminated cells. Alarmed and confused, several family members began questioning why they were receiving so many telephone calls requesting blood samples. In 1975, the family also learned through a chance dinner party conversation that material originating in Henrietta Lacks was continuing to be used for medical research. The family had never discussed Henrietta's illness and death among themselves in the intervening years but with the increased curiosity about their mother and her genetics, they now began to ask questions. Diagnosis and Treatment Death and Burial Neither Henrietta Lacks nor her family gave her physicians permission to harvest her cells. At that time, permission was neither required nor customarily sought. The cells were used in medical research and for commercial purposes. In the 1980s, family medical records were published without family consent. A similar issue was brought up in the Supreme Court of California case of Moore v. Regents of the University of California in 1990. The court ruled that a person's discarded tissue and cells are not their property and can be commercialized. Medical and Scientific Research Consent Issues and Privacy Concerns Recognition In Popular Culture In March 2013, Researchers published the DNA sequence of the genome of a strain of HeLa cells. The Lax family discovered this when the author Rebecca Sklut informed them. 
there were objections from the Lax family about the genetic information that was available for public access. Jerry Lax Y, a grandchild of Henrietta Lax, said to the New York Times, the biggest concern was privacy, what information was actually going to be out there about our grandmother, and what information they can obtain from her sequencing that will tell them about her children and grandchildren and going down the line. That same year another group working on a different HeLa cell lines genome under National Institutes of Health funding submitted it for publication. In August 2013, an agreement was announced between the family and the NIH that gave the family some control over access to the cell's DNA sequence found in the two studies along with a promise of acknowledgement in scientific papers. In addition, Two family members will join the six-member committee which will regulate access to the sequence data. In 1996, Morehouse School of Medicine held its first annual HeLa Women's Health Conference. Led by physician Roland Patillo, the conference is held to give recognition to Henrietta Lacks, her cell line, and the valuable contribution made by African Americans to medical research and clinical practice. The mayor of Atlanta declared the date of the first conference, October 11, 1996, Henrietta Lacks Day. Lacks' contributions continue to be celebrated at yearly events in Turner Station. At one such event in 1997, then U.S. Congressman from Maryland, Robert Ehrlich, presented a congressional resolution recognizing Lax and her contributions to medical science and research. Notes In 2010, the Johns Hopkins Institute for Clinical and Translational Research established the annual Henrietta Lacks Memorial Lecture Series to honor Henrietta Lacks and the global impact of HeLa cells on medicine and research. In 2011, Morgan State University in Baltimore granted Lacks a posthumous honorary doctorate in public service. Also in 2011, the Evergreen School District in Vancouver, Washington, named their new high school focused on medical careers the Henrietta Lacks Health and Bioscience High School, becoming the first organization to memorialize her publicly by naming a school in her honor. In 2014, Lacks was inducted into the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. In 2017, a minor planet in the main asteroid belt was named 359,426 lakhs in her honor. In 2018 the New York Times published a belated obituary for her. The question of how and whether her race affected her treatment, the lack of obtaining consent, and her relative obscurity, continues to be controversial. The HeLa cell line's connection to Henrietta Lacks was first brought to popular attention in March 1976 with a pair of articles in the Detroit Free Press and Rolling Stone written by reporter Michael Rogers. In 1998, Adam Curtis directed a BBC documentary about Henrietta Lacks called The Way of All Flesh. Rebecca Sklut documented extensive histories of both the HeLa cell line and the Lax family in two articles published in 2000 and 2001 and in her 2010 book The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lax. HBO announced in 2010 that Oprah Winfrey and Alan Ball were developing a film project based on Sklut's book, and in 2016 filming commenced. With Winfrey in the leading role of Deborah Lax, Henrietta's daughter. The film The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lax was released in 2017, with Renee Elise Goldsberry portraying Lax. NBC's Law and Order aired its own fictionalized version of Lax's story in the 2010 episode Immortal, 
which Slate referred to as shockingly close to the true story and the musical groups Jello Biafra and the Guantanamo School of Medicine and Ye's Air both released songs about Henrietta Lacks and her legacy. Members of the Lax family authored their own stories for the first time in 2013 when Lax's oldest son and his wife, Lawrence and Bobette Lax, wrote a short digital memoir called Hella Family Stories, Lawrence and Bobette with first-hand accounts of their memories of Henrietta Lax while she was alive and of their own efforts to keep the youngest children out of unsafe living environments following their mother's death. The Gila Project, a multimedia exhibition to honor Lax, opened in 2017 in Baltimore at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture. It included a portrait by Kadir Nelson and a poem by Saul Williams. <laughs>